we'll give uh, a few moments for people to join us. Maybe Anna, you could let me know when you have a good number there because I can't see this on my screen right now. Ah, there we are, okay, 50. Okay. Seems to be relatively stable. So good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome uh, to the first in our uh, series of webinars on research data management. I'm Paul Hendry, and I'm Vice Dean for Continuing Professional Development at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Medicine, and I've been part of the uh, planning committee for these webinars. Okay. So uh, by way of introduction, the series has been developed by the Ottawa Data uh, Champions team, which is funded by the Digital Research Alliance's Data Champions pilot project. And the goal is to develop a pan-Ottawa data champion program, including a training program to help improve the uh, quality of data management uh, and sharing in our field. Uh, you can see the activities planned by the group, so please continue to participate in our webinar series and visit the website and also look for the training programs uh, coming in the future. Our team has members from uh, different Ottawa institutions that you see there on the slide, and the committee is uh, com uh, comprised of members coming from those organizations. And uh, Kelly Colby is the PI on the project. So here's our website. Um, just uh, you can click on that, or you just write. It might be a little bit awkward to write that down at the moment, but uh, if we just go on to the uh, Ottawa Heart, uh, sorry, the uh, Ottawa Hospital Research Institute's uh, website, that'll uh, look for the uh, Center for Journal Journalology, and it's on that website. The Ottawa Data Champions uh, link is on there if you uh, would like to uh, look at that later. So uh, it's my pleasure to be able to uh, introduce our speakers. But before we do that, um, there are a few housekeeping notes I'd like to remind you about. So this workshop will be, uh, uh, there'll be 14 sessions weekly. Uh, so please check the website for more information on the sessions uh, that are, are upcoming. And uh, you have to register for each one, please. So the sessions will be recorded and they will meet, be made openly available on uh, the website that you, uh, you have been seeing there. And we are also providing French subtitles. Uh, the program is, is accredited for Royal College MOC credits and we'll be asking for an evaluation for each session. Before and after each session, however, there's going to be another survey, which is just going to be um, uh, checking on uh, what your understanding of the field is before and after. So if you wouldn't mind, we'd much appreciate if you were able to uh, reply to that anonymously and uh, we want to be able to use this uh, moving forward. So after the session, all residents are going to, uh, all registrants will uh, receive a, a survey to evaluate and then uh, we'll be getting a, uh, a certificate of attendance if you would like. And uh, we are going to be able to ta tailor our uh, future interventions based on uh, your feedback. Uh, so during the session, we're going to be using the chat function for questions. It's going to allow, allow us to manage the Q&A a little bit more uh, easily if we uh, if you just write your question in the chat, and uh, I'll be moderating uh, the chat questions as you move forward. And uh, I'll be asking the speakers to answer those questions. So without any further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. So uh, Dr. Dominique Roche is an ecologist and a meta scientist uh, who now is studying publicly shared research data or open data and with how it contributes to improving transparency, uh, reproducibility and collaboration in science. And the rest of the bios are all available on the website as well. Uh, Mr. Lee Wilson is the Director of Research Data Management at Digital Research Alliance of Canada. And he, in that position, he oversees the national research data management team at the Alliance. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dom, who's going to uh, start us off on uh, principles and policy and data management and sharing landscape in Canada. Great, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen here. Good. Can everyone see that now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Great. Okay. 
So yes, uh, as was mentioned, so uh, Lee and myself are going to tell you the principles and policies of the data management and sharing landscape in Canada. Uh, ooh, my battery is running low. Sorry, I have to. <laughs> the one thing that I had not planned for is plugging in my computer. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so sorry, just one second. There we go. Something one should never forget. Um, well, that's so why I was asked to sorry, provide um, some information on potential conflicts of interest. Um, these are all, uh, the positions I'll, I'll mention briefly are all volunteer. I'm not paid for any of this. So I'm an ambassador for the data repository Figshare um, and also for the Center for Open Science. I'm a member of the Canadian National Committee for CoData, and I'm also uh, the president of the Society for Open, Reliable, and Transparent Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I was a, a founding member of that society. If there are any ecologists uh, here in the audience who are interested in this, um, by all means, please get in touch with me afterwards. I, I'd love to tell you more about our awesome society. Um, so yeah, essentially what this webinar is about uh, is the, the what, why, and how of research data management and sharing. Um, but before you know, we get into the weeds of it, I wanted to provide a few key definitions to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, first of all, you know, it's important to know what are, what are research data. Um, it, it seems like somewhat of an impossible question to answer at first, but fortunately, um, the International Science Council's Committee on Data, so CODATA, um, has a, a really useful um, glossary of uh, terms related to research data management. And so um, they define data as um, a research data, data that are used as primary sources to support technical or scientific inquiry um, and are commonly accepted in the research community as necessary to validate research findings and results. So it's a very broad definition. Um, you can essentially understand that, you know, research data are uh, any piece of data or information that you collect while answering uh, a scientific question. Uh, and so, all right, we've got some research data of what we do with it. Well, hopefully we manage it, um, you know, through uh, what is commonly known as research data management, um, and it's often also abbreviated as RDM. And so code data defines this as um, storage, access, and preservation uh, of data created or collected in, in the course of research. And some of you might be more familiar with the term data stewardship. It's often used as a synonym um, for RDM. So RDM practices cover the entire life cycle of the data. Uh, it's important to manage data from, you know, the very onset of a research project um, all the way to the completion of the project uh, to ensure the long-term preservation of data once the research has been, um, has been concluded. So some examples of research data management practices include things like um, naming files and variables, making sure that your spreadsheets are well organized. So some people might be familiar with the tidy data concepts, uh, making sure that every, you know, every uh, column in your data set is a variable, every row is an observation. Um, a, a very important step also is to document your data. So create what's called metadata or data descriptors. So it's often a file or, or associated data that provide information about the data. And then RDM obviously includes things like data storage, access, and uh, security. So one component of research data management that is kind of a, a little bit of a standalone um, is, is data sharing. Um, so what is data sharing? It is the uh, activity of making your research data openly available for others to access and reuse um, and build on. And what I, why the reason I say it's you know, slightly of a, its own beast is because you can engage in research data management without necessarily engaging in data sharing. Right? You can make sure your data is well organized, well managed, securely stored, um, and then actually making it public is a, a slightly separate step. Um, and RDM, for example, might be required by some funding agencies, um, but uh, not data sharing, whereas some uh, funding agencies might require both uh, managing your data properly and also sharing them um, uh, openly. And so Lee's going to tell us about, a bit about that more in the Canadian context uh, in the second half of this presentation. So, um, you know, what I want to what I want to talk about right now a little bit is like why why is it important? Why do we manage and and share our data as researchers? And I, I think this is a really important question. 
and one that I started thinking about uh, back in 2013 when I, uh, when I was still a PhD student. And I published quite a bit about this. This is actually a figure um, from one of my early papers on the topic um, where, you know, with some colleagues, we, we reflect on the fact that you know, researchers work so hard to think of scientifically important and interesting questions. You know, they, they work really hard to acquire the funding to carry out the research, and then they supervise students and staff. Um, they do all this work, and then, um, you know, they might be asked to share or make these data publicly afterwards and, and essentially give it away to other people or other people to inspect and use. Um, so, uh, you know, there might be some conflicts there, whereas researchers sometimes feel like they have intellectual property rights over these data. Um, but there are obviously potential benefits for society to make these data public. And, and so I want to address that question a little bit. Why, why should we engage in good RDM practices and sharing data? You know, perhaps the most obvious answer is, uh, or, or the most straightforward one is, well, now it is required by many of the journals where we publish. Um, I'm an ecologist, and uh, here are some examples of some of the journals in my field that require authors to share their data as a condition of publication. Um, you know, we have here things like the Royal Society journals, all of the journals of the British Ecological Society, um, but also some general journals that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, like Nature and Science. All of these require uh, data sharing. A student and I actually recently did a, uh, a big study looking at all of the, the policies, the data sharing policies of uh, about 200 journals in ecology and evolution, and we found that 20% of them require data sharing. And overall, about 75% of these 200 journals have some sort of policy with regards to data. So they either encourage data sharing or they require a data availability statement. And like I said, about 20% actually require people to share data. Um, you know, it's not just journals now that are requiring data sharing. Funders are also starting to get on board. Um, you know, even uh, private philanthropies, so two of the most well-known ones are the Wellcome Trust in the UK and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, if you, you know, are funded by these uh, philanthropies and you don't share your data, you're never getting funding from them again. Um, there are also national funding bodies. So for example, in the UK, the Natural Environment uh, Research Council requires data sharing, and in the US, the NIH also does. Um, some of you here might have seen this huge announcement coming out uh, from the office of the White House. Uh, you know, I think it was 26 August, that was two weeks ago, probably. Um, this is a, a, an announcement in the journal Nature saying that, yeah, the U.S. government now um, is going to, uh, or sorry, the Biden administration is instructing all of the U.S. agencies to require immediate access to federally funded research after it's published. And this is starting in 2026. Um, so this is that, you know, the, the Office of the White House saying you don't have, it's not only about publishing your uh, papers open access, but we're also now going to require all of the data to be openly accessible, all of the data that underlie the results in these publications. So clearly there's a reason why these funding agencies and these journals are implementing these policies. Um, you know, I think they understand that publications, scientific publications are, are obviously important for communicating research findings, um, but they're really just the tip of the iceberg, right? There's all sorts of other really important um, things, including research products, that underlie um, what is presented in a scientific journal. Um, and obviously, one of these important um, uh, components uh, is, is research data. So what are the benefits? of uh, research data management and open data for, for society in general? Well, there's many of them. First of all, um, you know, the, it avoids data being lost to science. Um, we know that you know, when data are stored on personal hard drives uh, or notebooks, these can easily be broken or lost. Um, often, you know, researchers um, tend to go to the grave with their data when they're not shared publicly or at least archived on an institutional repository where maybe other people might have access to them. So, you know, managing properly allows other people to understand them and then sharing them allows people to, to reuse them so that they are not lost to the scientific enterprise. Um, doing this also accelerates scientific discoveries because researchers can then um, reuse existing data potentially to answer bigger and broader questions by aggregating data sets. Um, 
It improves uh, our return per taxpayer uh, um, dollar invested in research, um, and that is mostly through the uh, you know avoiding the duplication of effort in research. It increases our ability to reproduce and validate results. That is really important, obviously, for reproducibility purposes. It increases our confidence in research results that are published, and it also facilitates detecting fraud. Um, in my field, for example, in, in uh, ecology and evolution, there was a really high-profile case of fraud uh, in Canada, a Canadian researcher working on social, um, the behavior of social spiders. And uh, it was identified through open data sets that many of the uh, published papers from his lab were, um, were fraudulent. And so 12 of these papers were thankfully retracted thanks to um, journal requirements for open data. So what about researchers, right? There are obvious benefits of sharing data um, for uh, the society and science in general, but what about uh, the benefits for individual researchers? Well, you know, by managing our data um, better, we can achieve greater efficiency. We can simply think of, you know, what it's like sometimes to get uh, comments back from reviewers like six months after you submitted a paper and then having to go back to your data and understand what different variables are, what your color coding was, if you happen to use that. So Properly managing your data really helps in that sense to be more efficient. Um, also, if you want to reuse your data uh, a couple of years down the road, for example, you've collected some more and you want to aggregate the data set to do some reanalyses, so that's really good. So it leads to greater productivity. Um, you know, by sharing data, if everyone shares data, we as researchers also gain access to more data sets um, on which we can carry out research. Um, there's the potential also for new collaborations and co-authorships when we share our data. Um, you know, it often happens that people interested in reusing a data set will contact the original authors to acquire more information um, and, and often offer them to be, you know, collaborators or co-authors on a project. Um, their data sets that are archived on repositories also get permanent identifiers, so DOIs, and they can then be cited. And that can um, be used by researchers to showcase, you know, um, the how their data are being reused by others in uh, tenure and promotion applications, et cetera, et cetera. And there's also some evidence, which I, I will talk to in a bit, uh, uh, about uh, showing that there is up to a 25% citation advantage for papers that have uh, associated open data. All right, so that's great. You know, benefits for society, benefits for individual researchers. What is actually happening in terms of sharing practices? So this is a graph here uh, published by Mark Hanno, who is the founder of FixShare, um, and it's on a, a really neat blog called The Scholarly Kitchen. Uh, the graph shows the number of data repository DOIs, so across a number of different uh, well-known repositories over the years. And what we can see here is there's clearly an increase, you know, from about I don't know, a couple hundred data sets shared in 2011 to upwards of 25,000 DOIs created for data sets in 2021. Um, this is a trend that I've also been observing myself in, in my own research. Um, this graph here shows the percent of articles with open data um, from 2012 to 2020 for two uh, different fields of research um, that are hotly debated. Uh, so. There's a lot of mudslinging that happens in this field. This is comparative physiology. I'm not going to go into the details of what these are, but, you know, people are, they're very heated debates. And I think it's really encouraging to see that, you know, from 2012, we had about 10% of papers had associated open data, whereas in 2021, we're looking at about 50%. So even when things are contentious, people are sharing data, and that obviously can be um, beneficial for consensus building. So... That's great. We're seeing that more data are being shared, but um, you know, what about the quality of what is being shared? And this is something that I've looked at um, in, in some of my work uh, with a student. We looked at 25 data sets uh, every year from 2012 to 2020 that were archived in the repository Dryad. This is specific for ecology and evolution between the years 2012 and 2020. And so we looked, we scored basically the completeness of the data. So if you read a paper, how many of the variables that were measured are actually present in the data set? And we also scored data reusability. So how, how easy is it to actually reuse the data that are present in the data set? And what we found is that um, there hasn't been very much uh, of a change, actually, uh, you know, from 2012 to 2020. Um, and there's a lot of variation in kind of the quality 
of what is being shared. Some data sets are really complete and reusable, um, but some are, are not, uh, not at all. So this leads me to talk about um, you know, a very important concept when it comes to uh, research data management and sharing, um, the FAIR uh, sharing principles. So um, I briefly want to give you kind of a synopsis of what these, each one of these letters stands for. So F is findable, A accessible, I interoperable, and R reusable. So these are principles to help us ensure that the data that we share are as, uh, as you know, high quality as possible. So, uh, you know, for data to be findable, they need to have um, associated metadata, so information about the data that are detailed and informative. So, for example, having a spreadsheet with abbreviations and, you know, units that are not mentioned um, is not particularly helpful. These are the types of things that you might want to include in a metadata file um, to describe the data. Um, it's also important that the data and the metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. So this could be either a data repository or a portal that points um, users to a, a place where the data are, are archived. Um, and it's also important that the, the data uh, and metadata have a unique identifier. I mentioned that earlier. So it's the same as a paper. You can get a DOI when you archive your data set in um, uh, a repository, and then you can plug that DOI into doi.org and immediately find it. And you can also automate it through uh, software, basically, to, to search for a specific data set. So an example of where you might want to arc or, or find ideas of where you might want to archive your data, there's lots of repositories that exist out there. Um, and this is the Registry of Research Data Repositories. Um, it's a, a database, basically, of all of the repositories for data that exist out there. Um, you can search by discipline, but you can also filter. I don't know if this is big enough for everyone to see, but for example, these are exa um, you know, some uh, data repositories in the humanities and social sciences. You can see that there's 32. They're broken broken down into a finer kind of categorization here. Um, this is for biology. There's 174, so um, a very useful resource if you're thinking of where to archive your data. So, um, you know, why is it important to share data in one of these recognized or trusted repositories? Um, well, websites are ephemeral. You know, if you're sharing your data on your personal website, there's no guarantee that it's going to be there in, in, in perpetuity or in the long term, um, because we all know about URL decay, people take websites down, et cetera, et cetera. It's the same for journals, too. If you archive your data as supplementary material, you know, there's nothing guaranteeing that uh, the journal won't go belly up and your data won't disappear. Whereas you know, recognize and trusted repositories often have a plan for sustainability over a, a time span of often 50 years or so. So there's a greater guarantee that your data will, will have some permanence there. Um, you know, sharing data supplementary material um, uh, in journals is also not ideal because uh, it makes the data a lot harder to find. Um, it, it, your supplementary material is not readily searchable, and also often um, supplementary material is behind a journal paywall, so it's not accessible for people who don't have a subscription to that particular journal. And then again, you know, when you archive your data on a repository, you get a DOI. Um, this is good, like I mentioned, for boosting collaboration. People see your data, they can contact you, um, and you can gain credit um, from it uh, via having a, a citable um, you know, DOI. So these are some papers, or at least the ones that I know of, you know, uh, published in 2007, 13, and 20, that have found actually a link between um, data being associated with publications and higher citation rates for these papers. So clearly evidence that there is a benefit, a direct benefit to researchers um, from sharing their data. Um, so the second letter is A for accessible. I see that the clock is ticking, so I'm gonna go uh, a little bit faster over these. Um, you know, accessible metadata and data means that they can be retrievable by their identifier, their DOI, um, and also that in the case where researchers uh, are dealing with sensitive data, so this could be, for example, identifiers of human participants or patients or the location of endangered species, um, you know, it, it's not a great idea to put these data uh, um, or to make these data public because um, obviously there, there are constraints um, around sharing these data sets. We perhaps don't want to identify patients um, or, or tell people where 
uh, important endangered species are. So if we make the metadata available, saying, well, these data exist, these are the variables we've collected, we're protecting the data, but at the same time still you know, um, making these data findable and potentially accessible through something called access control. So um, when data are sensitive, we can um, advertise them through metadata and then uh, uh, if people contact us to use them, then we can say, okay, we'll verify their uh, their credentials and make sure that only people that have a good reason for accessing the data um, will actually have access to them. And I think Lee's going to talk about some initiatives, uh, sorry, in Canada that are specifically um, to help researchers with this with this um, problematic. Okay, so uh, the the third letter is interoperable. So data. Um, Essentially, uh, interoper interoperability means that data, um, you know, can be uh, can work. Essentially, it's products and systems being able to work with each other. So, um, if you share your data in a proprietary file format, so for example, MATLAB or SPSS, well, only people who have these programs will be able to, um, you know, view and potentially use your data. So, for data to be interoperable, you should share them in a non-proprietary file format, something like CSV or TXT. Um, it's also, whenever they're, they're available, it's good practice to use recognized standards and vocabularies. This is something that is used to make data not just human readable. So it's not um, you know, human readable data means that uh, anyone like myself can go and look at your spreadsheet and make sense of it. But we also want data ideally to be machine readable. So that if you're using a standard, um, a, a machine, a computer or software can interact with the data and aggregate big data sets together without necessarily having someone go through each column, for example, to match variables um, that are not using the same terminologies. So interoperable data are often referred to as structured data. And just to give you a quick example, um, in biodiversity research, um, you know, one database that I think is a prime example of data interoperability is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So this uh, repository hosts upwards of 2 billion um, occurrence records for, for given species. And the way that they allow researchers to work with all these data, clearly no one can interact you know, visually with 2 billion data sets, is by using um, a standard called Darwin Core. And so um, all of the data have the same uh, kind of variable names, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can easily be um, aggregated and worked with. And finally, the, the last letter in these FAIR principles is the R for reusable. So um, what is really important here to promote data reusability is that the data and metadata should have a clear usage license. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Creative Commons license that state under which a condition's data can be reused and how. Um, again, data and file formats should be easy to reuse. Um, so I gave the example of CSV, TXV, TXT um, and following you know, good uh, research data management practices like the tidy, tidy data principles. Um, and then it's important also for metadata to be clear and complete so third parties can understand, readily understand data. And uh, the last point is that data should be as raw as possible. So a good example here is if you're doing, for example, a principal component analysis, well, sharing these principal components without sharing the underlying data that was fed into that, that model uh, is, you know, doesn't necessarily lead to the, the data being um, reusable. Um, so this is a very brief overview of what these FAIR principles are. Um, and there are other really important principles as well when we think about you know, good practices in, in data management and sharing. One important set of principles are the CARE principles for Indigenous data sovereignty. Um, these were put together by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance. I, I won't have time to go over them in detail, but there are other webinars in this series um, where um, these principles will be covered um, and, and you'll have more information on them. So they stand for collective uh, benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And just lastly also, um, in Canada, we are fortunate to have some guidelines also that were created by the First Nations Information Government Center. So these are called the First Nations Principles of OCAP, um, which stands for Ownership, Control, Access, and Possession. So anyone working with uh, you know, data that uh, uh, or collaborating with Indigenous and local communities um, should be aware of these principles. 
and um, in addition to, to the FAIR principles in order to share following best practices. So I'm going to stop here uh, and let Lee tell you a little bit more about these principles and practices in the context of uh, Canadian data management and sharing. There we go. Great. And is everyone able to see my screen? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Um, that was a fantastic overview. Um, and um, I'll, I'll kind of do my best to, to move us through, give us lots of time for, for questions at the end. Uh, and I may skip over some parts where you've already sort of covered it perfectly. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so, so thanks, Dom, and uh, thank you to the organizers uh, of this uh, session for the opportunity to, to co-host uh, the presentation today. Um, as a part of the conflict of interest requirements for the session, I will state that I'm an employee of the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, uh, which I think will become apparent uh, through this presentation. Um, and uh, the Alliance has provided funding to support this series as a part of our Data Champions Funding Initiative. I'm also a member of the Research Data Alliance Executive Council. Uh, I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Halifax, Nova Scotia, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And in my section, I'm going to give a brief introduction to the Alliance and its RDM team. And then I'll provide an overview of what I'd say is the main policy driver in Canada right now, um, aside from, from journals and, and other things, but in, in terms of our funding agencies, which is the tri-agency RDM policy. Uh, as I work through that policy, I'll be highlighting major considerations for researchers, uh, some of the timelines around implementation, and then national services, tools, and resources that are available to researchers um, to help uh, you comply with the policy requirements. So the Alliance is a new national not-for-profit funded by Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada um, that seeks to catalyze world-class Canadian research by being a trusted, inclusive, and collaborative partner as we work towards providing sustainable, researcher-centric, and integrated digital research infrastructure for Canadian researchers. Uh, stated at the top of this slide, the Alliance's main activities uh, regarding its services can be illustrated with six sort of overarching facets. Uh, in which the Alliance's guiding principles, vision, and mission are all, are all reflected. So nationally, we look at coordinating advanced research computing, research data management, and research software, as well as cybersecurity. Um, and all of this is sort of packaged up as digital research infrastructure, or DRI. Under the Alliance, the R RDM is composed of a national coordination and service delivery team, that works with community partners to deliver things like training and outreach, services, policies, and support for best practices, tools and infrastructure platforms. And at the core of everything that we do is our RDM network of experts. This is a grassroots community of practice of information and data professionals comprising over 150 experts from across 70 plus Canadian academic and research institutions. The Alliance supports a full suite of national RDM services and programs, and these are freely available to researchers, administrators, or research support professionals at Canadian post-secondaries and other research organizations. So these include a data management planning tool, two national multidisciplinary repository options, and these provide storage, access, and preservation of research data, a national data discovery service, that aggregates metadata records across Canadian repositories, allowing researchers to find Canadian research data wherever it lives, and then vital infrastructure components that support persistent identifiers like ORCID IDs and DOIs. Our goal in all of this is to help researchers and institutions meet their research data management needs. And a focal point of our efforts in this regard have been in redressing, uh, addressing requirements of the recently launched Canadian Tri-Funders, so that's SHRC, CIHR, and NSERC, RDM policy. This policy represents the next step in the Government of Canada's commitment to open science, and it builds on things like the 2015 
open access policy on publications, and the 2016 Statement of Principles on Digital Data Management. The policy has three main components. The first is the requirement for developing an institutional RDM strategy. The second is a requirement for data management plans to be included with grant applications. And finally, where it's appropriate, there's going to be a requirement for depositing data into a trustworthy digital repository. So I'll start with the institutional RDM strategy requirement. This is going to be required for all post-secondaries and research hospitals that are able to administer tri-agency grants. An important part of this strategy is that it must recognize data as a first-class research output alongside more traditional outputs such as academic papers. The institutional strategy must also clearly promote the importance of RDM to various stakeholders across campus. The strategy will then provide support and guidance to researchers in RDM best practices and principles, and it needs to ensure that institutions are able to either provide themselves or uh, provision or support access to services, tools, and platforms that are going to help researchers meet these policy requirements. The strategy must also recognize that data created in the context of research by and with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities, collectives, and organizations will be managed according to the principles developed and approved by and in partnership with them. In terms of implementation, by March 1st, 2023, research institutions that are subject to this requirement must post their RDM strategies and notify the agencies that they've been completed. To support this, we've developed a variety of resources aimed at helping Canadian post-secondaries and research hospitals develop their institutional RDM strategy. Uh, and this includes a development template and guidance document, as well as a series of panel discussions that the Alliance will be hosting on institutional research data management strategy development this fall. Uh, this panel series was developed by members of the RDM network of experts, as well as representatives from the tri-agencies. Discussions will focus, <clears throat> excuse me, on three active stages uh, related to the, the strategies, and that's initiating, planning, and drafting, uh, all aimed at helping institutions meet the March 2020, uh, 2023 deadline. Dates of the different uh, panels are, are shown on the slides and registration is now open under the Alliance's events page. The next requirement is for data management plans or DMPs as they're known. When this component of the policy comes into force, DMPs will be required for certain funding opportunities. And it's important to note that this is not simply a check checkbox activity. Uh, DMPs will be considered as a part of the adjudication process. And for research conducted with and by First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities, DMPs must be co-developed in accordance with RDM principles or in DMP formats that they accept. So taking a step back quickly, uh, what are DMPs? Well, a DMP describes the data that you expect to acquire or generate through the course of a project, and it also explains how you will manage, describe, analyze, and store your data, as well as details how you will share and preserve your data when the project's finished. An important consideration in all of this is that DMPs are living documents that need to be updated and revisited throughout a project's life cycle. So why make a DMP? Uh, well, it helps you to formalize the process of how you will manage, describe, and analyze your data. Uh, it allows you to see any potential weaknesses uh, in your planned approach before they happen. It provides a record of what you intend or, or intended to do that can be shared with collaborators or used for future reference. And finally, planning produces stronger research projects and outcomes. Really, another important point in this is that DMPs are not just administrative or, or something you do because it's required. The exercise and act of thinking through your project and its data from the beginning to the end has almost as much value as the output of the report itself. For researchers in need of help developing a DMP to comply with the new policy, we have the DMP assistant. So this is a national, bilingual data management planning tool 
that helps researchers better manage your data throughout the lifespan of a project. It's hosted by the University of Alberta Libraries and supported by the Alliance. And it allows you to develop a DMP following a series of key data management questions. And all of these are supported by best practice guidance and examples. The tool is free to use regardless of your institutional affiliation or non-affiliation. So with the DMP Assistant, researchers can create, can create DMPs using a generic template or an organization, discipline, or methodology specific template. And I'll have more information on that later. Um, they can see guidance appropriate to the particular template they're using and their organization. They can collaborate with multiple researchers on a plan and connect with local guidance and support for data management at, academic, at their institutions or research organizations. For administrators, uh, they can manage their institutional space within the platform, customize any one of the suite of existing system templates for their organization, create institution-specific templates and guidance, as well as view information about DMP assistant usage and usage statistics at their organization. We have also recently developed a new administrator's guide for the DMP assistant that's being shared out with users for further refinement ahead of publication. So in addition to the, the platform itself, we published 13 discipline and methodology specific DMT, DMP templates. These templates have been community developed and they're composed of sections, questions, and guidance that covers a range of disciplines and research methods, highlighting best practices for DMPs within those disciplines and providing tailored guidance for researchers writing their own DMPs. These templates are all embedded for use in English and French within the platform and also available from the Alliance website under the training resources page linked here. In addition to the templates, we also offer a suite of nine discipline and methodology specific DMP exemplars. So these community developed exemplars also cover a wide range of disciplines and methods and highlight best practices for DMPs within those disciplines. Where the templates provide the sections and questions to be answered by researchers uh, accompanied by guidance, these exemplars are examples of fully completed DMPs, some of which are hypothetical and some are based on real research topics pulled from the community. These are all also available uh, from the Alliance website under training resources. In terms of implementation for this policy requirement, the agencies will be identifying the initial set of funding opportunities subject to the requirement by spring 2023 and are planning to roll it out selectively before that date. So moving on to the third component of the policy, which is data deposit. The policy states that researchers will be required to deposit into a digital repository, all digital research data, metadata and code that directly supports the research conclusions in journal publications and preprints that arise from agency supported research. Unpacking that statement a little bit, data deposit is expected by the time of a paper's publication. Um, to support this, many repositories offer embargo and journal reviewer uh, features to allow the work of preparing a data submission to take place before the data are published or made openly available. Uh, and this provides time for the paper publication process to be completed before the data sets are shared or uh, put into a repository. The tri agencies are not prescriptive about which repositories are to be used. Um, it's, the policy states that the choice of repository can be guided by disciplinary expectations as well as the researcher's own judgment. Uh, but in all cases, the repository must ensure safe storage, preservation, and curation of the data. Importantly, this is not a requirement to share all data, openly or otherwise. The policy states that researchers must provide appropriate access to the data where ethical, cultural, legal, and commercial requirements allow. Further, while discovery and access is a goal of many data repositories, not all repositories are open or open by default. Controlled access repositories do exist, with more work being done in this area, which I'll talk about uh, near the end of the talk. Uh, and there is also great value in working to ensure that research data is well described, 
curated and securely stored for preservation, even if it can't be shared openly. It's also possible to provide open access to metadata records, uh, so descriptions about the research data uh, and its project, even if the data themselves can't be made openly available. When it comes to data generated from research conducted by and with First Nations, Métis and Inuit communities, they will guide and ultimately determine how the data are collected, used and preserved, and will have the right to repatriate that data. This could lead to exceptions within the tri-agency requirement. Now I'll talk about the national repository options that are available to help researchers publish their data in a trustworthy, recognized digital repository. So these two national options I want to highlight today are the Federated Research Data Repository, or FERDER, and Borealis, which is a national instance of Dataverse operated by Scholars Portal based at the University of Toronto. Both of these repositories support the discovery and open access of research data, and both are working towards achieving a core trust seal designation, as I mentioned in the chat earlier. And this is an internationally recognized standard for trustworthy digital repositories. So starting with Borealis, this is the name for a nationally hosted instance of the Dataverse repository platform maintained by Scholars Portal at the University of Toronto. Borealis provides robust shared storage infrastructure, consolidates platform development and maintenance, provides a distributed model that's both equitable and sustainable. It allows for institutional specific branding as well as branding for specific research groups. And it gives researchers direct control over their data. Over 55 Canadian post-secondary institutions are now included within this Borealis consortium. And it's very likely um, that your institution already provides access to this important service. As a starting point, I would recommend reaching out to your institutional library to learn more about the service and then any other additional supports that could be available. In a lot of cases, the library can help you to curate and prepare your data for submission into the repository. Borealis serves the long tail of the research data ecosystem in Canada very well, housing over three terabytes of data, consisting of over 8,000 data sets, though I think that number has, has grown quite a bit this year, um, and over 100,000 files to date. And these are submitted by researchers uh, across institutions, across Canada, and across a, a variety of disciplines. So in contrast, FERDER is purpose-built to meet the repository needs of researchers that are working with bigger data. Um, and, and this is often data that would be part of an advanced research computing or HPC context. Um, and that scale infrastructure that individual institutions are often not equipped to provide. Um, so to date, FERDER directly stewards over 100 terabytes of research data from more than 3,000 data, 300, sorry, data sets. So you can sort of see that distinction there. Uh, further, uh, to unpack it a little bit, is a scalable federated platform for digital research data management and the discovery of Canadian research data. It's a national multidisciplinary repository hosted on Canada's National Advanced Research Computing Infrastructure that specializes in large data deposits. We have a national curation team that ensures that all data deposited undergoes review prior to deposit so that it's optimized for discoverability and reuse. We also have a preservation coordinator that can work with you to assess whether your data is appropriate for additional preservation processing and long-term archiving. Further is delivered through the support of many different partners, uh, I'll, I'll put up here on the screen, uh, and is available to all researchers at Canadian post-secondary and research institutions. This slide represents a broad sampling of the kinds of groups currently using FERDER, and it was built to serve the needs of many research partners, representing a variety of disciplinary needs. Uh, I won't go over the slide in too much detail because I think Dom covered it quite well, but there are obviously many benefits to depositing data uh, within a repository. Uh, one study I will highlight um, suggests that the availability of research data that hasn't been published in a repository declines rapidly year over year um, and found that the likelihood of data availability declined by as much as 17% each year. 
So while there are a growing number of options available to support you in data deposit nationally, locally, and across disciplines, this policy component is still very much on the horizon with a firm implementation date not yet set. This requirement will be phased in after a review of the inter um, institutional strategies that are being developed now and an assessment of the readiness of the Canadian research data community. One area where we know that there are still gaps is in the deposit of sensitive data uh, and particularly data that may require controlled or restricted access. So to address this gap, we are engaged in a new development and pilot project to expand further and other repository platforms capabilities to support sensitive research data. This project uses zero knowledge encryption technologies and we're developing tools and workflows to support the discovery and controlled access to encrypted sensitive data packages. But of course, technology is only one part of this puzzle. Uh, policy is another big piece and policy development represents a major challenge that needs to be addressed before any kind of sensitive data repository service could be rolled out nationally. The goal for this next phase of the project is to collaborate with post-secondary institutions, research organizations, and repository service providers on data access and sharing terms and conditions that can be made broadly applicable across institutions and uh, institutions and jurisdictions. Just, uh, we will just achieve have 10 this. Left. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thanks, yeah, Paul. Thanks. Yeah, just wrapping up now. Uh, through the development of uh, a number of pilot working groups, and these will be populated with appropriate representatives from participating institutions, uh, and they'll be working through questions around things like research ethics, privacy, research contracts, IT supports, researcher supports, and governance. So this work will not be done overnight. Um, this is a very preliminary timeline, but you can see that we'll be working on this over the next several years. And if you're interested in learning more, please reach out and we can arrange um, a presentation or, or a consultation session with the project leads. Uh, and we are currently in the process of meeting with interested stakeholders and potential partners ahead of the pilot launch. Well, I hope this overview, as quick as it was, was helpful in understanding the upcoming policy requirements and highlighting just some of the supports that are available to you nationally through the Alliance and our partners. Thank you. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, uh, virtual applause. Um, thanks very much, uh, Lee and Dom, for great presentations that provide a lot of uh, very useful information uh, to, our, to the group here. Um, we have a number of questions. Uh, the first one really was around um, about uh, trusted Canadian repositories, and I think you both have have alluded to some of those and in the chat, uh, David Moore and others have uh, put in um, uh, a number of ideas there. Uh, do you want to just maybe do an overview of when one thing com comes up as uh, someone re doing research to say, well, which one, how do I decide? Um, where, do, where do I put my uh, data? And uh, maybe if you would like to um, add to any other repositories or a list of repositories that you might be able to, uh, we'll, we could post perhaps. Uh, or um, and what, what's, your, what's your perspective on uh, the, I guess there's quite a, a choice now. Yeah, I can start and then maybe I'll turn it over to Dom. This one is tricky uh, and we've long resisted trying to put together any such list um, because it could be a, a little bit contentious and also it's a changing landscape as you've noted. Mm -hmm. so, so resources like Re3 Data that Dom pointed out uh, and fair sharing is another good one. Um, are sort of aggregators for repository services. Um, typically, the advice is to prefer disciplinary repositories where they exist, um, and then moving on to, to generalist uh, uh, repositories. Um, the notion of trustworthiness um, it, it can be a difficult concept, uh, but things like Core Trust Seal, which, which as I mentioned, um, we're leading a, a cohort program um, to, to achieve uh, Core Trust Seal broadly, among a variety of Canadian repositories uh, can be a good indicator. Well, that it would be an excellent indicator of, of trustworthiness. Um, and I think finally, uh, for researchers looking for guidance, um, there are some, some resources available online and on the website, uh, but I would connect with your, your local library or your institutional library, uh, and they'll be the best people to sort of help walk you through uh, the different options available and the pros and cons and things like that. Right. And uh, Kelly's also added that uh, when you're cho choosing repositories, you should always ensure that it's FIPA or HIPAA compliant. Um, another question came up uh, as you were speaking was uh, about uh, the website for Lunaris. 
Um, do we have that available? We can probably post sure. that, I would imagine. Yeah. So, so a little bit of uh, a little bit of context there. So, so currently, um, the discovery service is is included within Furter. Um, so Furter is both the repository that I, that I talked about, and it's also that metadata aggregation discovery uh, service as well. Um, but it will be launching as a standalone platform um, in in 2023 um, called Lunaris. Um, so sort of separating out the, those two functions, and Furter will continue to exist, uh, but focusing just on the uh, the repository service. Great. And uh, there's another question about uh, templates. Are there templates for biomedical research data? And uh, Dr. Moore had uh, suggested not yet, but uh, any uh, comments on that? Any additional comments on uh, templates? Uh, I, I don't know if you're asking. In, 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 in general, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, please, please. I mean, as I indicated, that's sort of one of our goals in, in the program funding that we've received from the alliance is, is to focus on uh, templates, uh, for example, for, for clinical trials and, uh, you know, observational studies such as case control studies, cohort studies. Um, and and uh, uh, hopefully we'll have those available, um, you know, within mm -hmm. our funding period. Great. Thanks. If I can just add a quick comment to the, the previous Please. question about like choosing a repository, it, it is really important. Like you know, we, we, I mentioned quickly this one resource, Re3 Data, that that Lee um, also pointed out. I think as he mentioned, what people really have to think about is like what types of data are you using. Like, and it makes sense to consider whether you have structured data or unstructured data. So structured data would be data that are discipline specific and have a given standard. Um, so I mentioned, for example, biodiversity data. If I have data on the occurrence of species, I it would make no sense for me to go and archive it on a generalist like mm. repository like uh, Figshare or, or Zenodo, for example, because there are established standards for these data and there's a dedicated repository for it, which is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. In biomedical sciences, I'm, I'm not super familiar with that field, but I'm sure that there are very similar types of repositories and standards exist. So again, like Lee mentioned, librarians, like research data uh, librarians are, are very aware of these and they can point researchers to the, you know, in the right direction to choose the correct repository. It's also beneficial for the researcher as in like for discoverability, if you want your data to be reused or contribute basically to you know, advancing knowledge, well, you want it to be in a place where they will be appropriately managed and shared. Thanks. Another question is, uh, when it comes to clinical research on human participants, do we need to have ethics approvals for data sharing? Uh, what about patient consent to be part of that uh, data source? And also, what are the Canadian repository for clinical research? Well, I can start on that one. Um, so I, I think the, the answer to the, the first two questions, uh, generally speaking, is, is yes, um, with all kinds of you know, contingencies and things like that. Um, but, and then what are the Canadian repositories? Yeah, so I think what I'd like to do, I've copied this question and uh, I'd like to kind of take it away uh, and consult with some colleagues and, and maybe come back then with a, uh, a list of, of appropriate repositories. Um, I, I could probably name a few now, but, but I'd rather sort of uh, give a more fulsome answer. Dom, unless you have any at the, at the top of your head that uh, would be appropriate to highlight. No, I'm I'm not super familiar with biomedical data or clinical data, to be honest. Um, so I, I unfortunately I can't add more. So I understand there um, there are likely going to be some future sessions that may be uh, touching on these points. So mm -hmm. uh, keep posted and please uh, attend the rest of the webinars. Uh, I think that's the end of the questions that I see here. So uh, I think you must have answered a lot of the uh, questions in terms of uh, what to do and. Um, so on behalf of our um, uh, planning committee, I would like to thank uh, you, Lee and Dom Dominique, for uh, your time and expertise for sharing. Um, and uh, also on behalf of uh, Kelly, Kobe, and uh, David, uh, I would like to thank you very much for attending, uh, all the participants who have joined us. And also, um, please uh, uh, sign up for the other 13 webinars that are uh, will be every week until December. So we look forward to seeing your participation in all those as well. 
So uh, thanks, everyone. And unless there are any other last que uh, comments anyone would like to make. No, thank you very much for the invitation. It was fun. Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Uh, so good after good good morning, everyone, and have a great uh, rest of the week. Thanks again. Bye now.